Today we are at Promaz and we're going to be filming the assembly of this very shiny 20B 3 rotor. For over 20 years, Australian Mazda performance powerhouse Promaz has specialised in everything rotary powered. From mild street engines to utterly wild race applications, Promaz also carries our complete driveline and EFI tuning upgrades. We caught up with the team while they were piecing together a very high output 3 rotor 20B engine capable of over 1500 horsepower. So Simon from Promaz, I do a lot of work with you but I've never filmed a 3 rotor assembly. Tell us a bit about these awesome plates. I don't think we've ever filmed anything engine wise so yeah. this is our first time yeah. which is good. These billet plates are obviously made by Billet Pro, they're the best in the world, amazing products. Uh, these have been on the cards for quite a while. It's a special purple anodized that we got really done. Nice. Yeah, yeah, it did come up nice. It's a long process because you got to make all the individual, yeah. get them all made and then take them all down to get anodized at once. Yeah. Then get them back, get all the uh, engraving done and all the studding uh, machined and everything like that. Get all the bridge porting done and on the CNC, so it's, it's Yeah, and, really and obviously nice. what we're filming in a way is sort of quite simple in terms of there's so much, work, like you just said, there's so much work not only with these, but with the rotors and the housing that goes yeah. on before assembly like any engine. But we're just gonna show some assembly stuff now. And I know you said to me earlier, it's actually going overseas. Yeah, it's going to New Jersey. And, and it's, uh, it's not going into a Mazda. No, it's going into a BMW. BMW. He's doing a bit of drags, some half mile stuff. Okay, so it's sort there. of like a street. Yeah, car. street, but more, well, more rowdy, track, I suppose. Rowdy street car, Yeah, rowdy. That's it. <laughs> All right, let's All get right. into it. We'll get into it. So, Simon, this looks like a bridge port. Yep. So, it's a bridge port, semi-PP. Our primary ports, because of the Billet Pro plates, allow us to uh, run a really big primary port. Helps with a lot of low-down torque and a lot more power. How long have you been building these Mazda engines for? Probably 26 years now. 26 26 years. or 27 years, yeah. Yeah. People get very tribal with them. Yeah, everyone builds their engines different. Yeah, I know. I still do stuff nowadays that I was doing 27 years ago. Yeah. Just a habit and, um, yeah, you just want to stick to the same system all the time. This crank, nice bit of gear. Yeah, so this crank is an aftermarket replica of the factory crank with Billet Pro's added bearing support for the centre plate. It's got a special sleeve as part of the crank here where the, the roller bearing runs on. Uh, helps support the nose of the crank. Oh yeah. Yeah. 20 B suffer a lot from that. We've found it to be really good and reliable. So we use factory O-rings, most reliable. Always put the join the inlet port. Where's your, massive, where's your massive tub of Vaseline? No Vaseline, yeah. <laughs> Look, Vaseline's petroleum based, so it's really no good for the O-rings. Yeah, yeah. So that's a big no-no. Usually I prep the rotors with Vaseline. But I haven't done that today. I've actually used the silicon grease on it. Uh, just so you can see, the side seal is a lot clearer by not putting Vaseline all over it. Yeah, you can. Normally you can't see anything. Yeah. Well, I, we've spent probably an easy two days prepping this engine before this assembly process. Yeah. Luke's probably spent a day prepping the plates, getting them ready, putting all the gears in and getting all the inserts in from uh, once it's all been machined. As you can see, these inserts are amazing quality. So they're cast iron? Yeah, it's a cast iron insert. All right, so now I'm going to start with the center rotor. So we always start from the center, build the back first. We've got two shorter studs that will hold the back together while we flip it over and do the front. So when you do the dump, dummy assembly, how much of this do you do? None of this. I don't put the rotors in. So yeah. everything but the rotors. So you're just putting the, the studs in and make sure? Yeah. Just mainly for the, the crankshaft, make sure I get all my end float, make sure everything's right there. So something about these semi-PP, which is uh, a lot different than other people that machine them in. So Billet Pro have come up with a, uh, this sort of design where it's O-ringed between the two surfaces. So actually water can run in through there and, and not leak and... From here it looks factory. Yeah, it's a beautiful setup. Very nice finish. We've tested it to probably 75, 80 PSI. It actually bites into the gasket. There's no O-ring or 
Okay. So it's as per factory yep. gasket. A lot of people put an O-ring there yeah, and that, yeah. an O-ring and a gasket, and it creates all sorts of problems. So, yeah, we found this design to work the best for our needs. This has all been polished by hand, Simon. Yeah. The wow. guy done an awesome job, didn't he? That's a lot of work. A lot of people run like a 25, 26 mil port, semi-PP. We're probably the only ones that run a 30 mil. Why 30? I know that's a bit bigger than what some other people... Bigger the better, I suppose. Yeah. I guess uh, you guys do a lot of testing. Back. Yeah. We've got the 13Bs up around the 1500 horsepower, so with this same port. What sort of RPM would you limit an engine like this to? I know the 20Bs don't like the RPM like the twin rotors. Yeah, but I, I could see one of these engines going to, you know, 1800, 2000 horsepower. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, the limit is going to be the crankshaft. Mm. But that's why we've got the extra bearing support to help it on its way. But yeah, this will make a comfortable 1500. Yeah, but everyone talks horsepower. It's not just, uh, if you've never experienced a 20B, it's like uh, small block versus big block. Yeah, it is. On the exactly. street, like it's just instant talk. Yeah. We've just done one recently and it makes 800 horsepower through the auto at yeah. the wheels. Yeah. So it's close Pretty to easy not, too. Yeah, 950 horsepower flywheel yeah. and yeah, it does it pretty easily. Pretty it's easy. only on about 20, 22 pounds or something like that. This is part of my 27 year habit that I'm struggling to break. It's never let me down. Oh, I look terrible, but it does the job. I've seen this stuff used in many, many applications. Ah, oh, old mechanics love it. We've just got to come up with a better brush. Okay, Apex seal time. So these are unbreakable aftermarket Apex seals. I'm not sure if you can see in the camera, but the machine work on them is amazing. They're a real good, high quality aftermarket seal that we use and recommend. Yeah, they handle big power. The good thing is they don't break. So if you have a little mishap, these aren't going to shatter all your housings. Yeah. Uh, they'll bend and pull them out. Put another set in and off you go again. I like to put them in with the assist piece on and fight the way I'm fighting now. <laughs> but at least I know the assist piece is Ooh, it's actually super glued on. And that's how they are from factory. Uh, when I was over in Orlando, they actually broke them off and they'd put them in a lot different than what I'm doing now, which for me, you know, didn't make me comfortable doing it that way. Okay, you can go now. Yep. the way the insert's held in. So it's got this single nut that tightens the insert in and tightens it evenly in the middle. You'll see a lot of billet plates with screws all over them. But we like these because they actually torque down the center to 100 Newton meters and um, yeah, clamps it down evenly in the center. And obviously the rotor housing. When you, when you see it apart and being put in, it, you realize it, it can't come out. Nah. It's an insert. Oh, I'm marking it with my fingers, but uh, the quality is amazing. Yeah, that's where the threaded nut goes in to hold it in. You're probably wondering why I've got Norton products behind me here. Because once we finish, we've got to clean it all. And there's nothing better than Norton's liquid ice to clean it all up and make it look even better than what it is. Rear plate can go on and we can uh, tighten up the the rear and spin it over and do the front. So here we've got a couple of standard size um, studs. So uh, it's a Billet Pro stud kit. We've got our three different lengths. That, they're our main ones that go through the whole engine. We need assembly ones. So there's two to hold the rear together and then there's two to hold the front together yeah. and then we can put it all together. So obviously the engine's fully studded, which holds it all together, precision. The main reason we stud an engine, obviously, um, when you start making power, the engine starts to twist on yeah, itself. Yeah. So by studding it, um, and you're talking 16 studs right around the engine, and they're precisionly precision machined, they can't move. No. The engine can't move. 
These two studs will hold it together while we flip it over and do the front of the engine. Also while we've got it here at the back you'll notice uh, we've got stationary gear with a whole heap of bolts there. Obviously a billet aluminium plate can expand, contract. We feel the more bolts are better, I suppose, holding that stationary yep. gear in. But we've never had any movement or anything like that. Now that looks awesome. That's looking good. So now we'll assemble the front. You can see the Torrington bearing inside, which will these help support a, the shaft. These have a Torrington bearing standard, don't they? No. No? No. They're just um, Babbitt, they call it. Babbitt oh, yeah. bearings. Yeah. Factory. Well, Billet Pro have added this in to help support the centric shaft. Uh, most important thing when uh, you're assembling tapered two-piece shafts is the taper must be dry, really dry. So no oil, it's pretty crucial. It's always good to lap the, the tapers in. We've got oil on where the bearing's going to run. One important thing is uh, obviously a keyway. Factory ones are not recommended high horsepower application. As the factory machine their dowel pins, so they're loose for the front plate. Obviously, we don't want that. We want to have our engine as locked in and tight as possible. So um, we run the standard dowel pins in the front, and obviously the studs right through the engine. Just in the front. Yeah, so just in the front, they run a like a floating dowel. Let's say. Let's say that would help for any misalignment in the front because it's a two-piece crank, and they're not too concerned about movement because yeah. they don't make much power. A bit like an RX-8, Simon. Nothing like an RX-8, man. <laughs> 20Bs and RX-8s shouldn't be in the same sentence, unless you're putting a 20B in an RX-8. Well, you've done that a few times, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, that's a good conversion. Yeah. Simon, I notice you haven't been using a hammer to smash this into pieces. What's going on? Uh, it all goes together nicely when it's all prepped well. And it's all brand new, so... Yeah, yeah. When it's new, and the billet plates make it easy as well it's, they're all precision so ah, it's all going together really well the assist piece on the rear went like that if you can see the assist piece there oh yeah yeah so building the front we put the assist piece down not up like we did on the rear can you accidentally do that wrong doesn't really matter mm. it's an assist piece so it's helped the pressure on the apex seal it doesn't matter whether it's up or down but i like to keep it consistent yeah but there's probably somebody out there that will disagree with me, but you'll probably notice the corner seals as well. Some people will notice they're a bit different. They're actually an aftermarket race corner seal as well. We've had a lot of success with them, so we run them in all our customers' engines. Last plate. Last plate. And we can uh, put the two short studs in, flip it around and put all the big studs in. Nice and easy. All our seals are good. So, same as what we did on the rear. We've got a couple of short studs. These are for the front. These will hold it together while we flip it over and uh, put all the long studs in. These are the O-rings we run to seal them. You probably noticed I didn't put any on their backside, but I will put them in once I uh, Turn it back over. This will seal any coolant that wants to come through those studs. They're a one-time use O-ring, so they'll actually bite into the stud and seal right around and bite into the plate. All Billet Pro stud kits come with ARP half-inch nuts and washers. You know that? And the beautiful that's looking. That is an what sexy an engine. bit of gear. So these are made of 4140 centerless ground bar. While we like to think they're all perfect, they're not, but they're the closest you're gonna get to a straight rod. So this is how I used to wind down all my nuts. Sounds a bit rude, but you know. But times have changed. And young guys come here and uh, introduce me into these. So we just wind them down, we're not tensioning them, we're just winding them down, nice and easy. A lot of these new impact uh, wrenches have, you know, finger tight, finger tight yeah. type settings anyway. Yeah. All we're doing is just bringing the nuts down, yeah. it saves us so a little bit of time. 
and you'll see how much we have to wind them down with the torque wrench. What do you set these to? Uh, these I set to 40 Newton meters. Some people might say, oh, it's a bit too tight, it's a bit too loose. That's my setting. Yeah. <laughs> it works for me, all my race engines. You'll see, I'm nowhere near my torque setting with that gun. You can hear all the assist pieces starting to break mm. as uh, we're winding everything down. Everything's starting to clamp up. Yeah, it's an old torque wrench, but it's made in Australia. It's uh, my trusty old torque wrench that I've always had. Some people have got digital ones and all sorts of yeah. stuff. This is my choice of torque wrench. Hey, you can spend a bit of coin on a torque wrench these days. These days, yeah, apparently. There is a sequence that we're doing. Here goes another assist piece breaking off. They're all super glued on. So as the uh, plates come together, we'll crack them off. They're designed to break. Yeah, designed to break that super glue. So that there is beautiful. That's a good sign. So we've already got O-rings under these that we put earlier. So no need to take these back off, just tighten them up. And we'll actually let it all settle and then we'll um, we'll recheck them again. From here on, I've already done it. I've pre-assembled this engine before we assembled it tonight because I always do a dummy check, make sure everything's perfect. And while I do a dummy check of everything, um, I always do my end float. So the end float's already been done. Um, so we'll just assemble all the front and then put the front cover on. You see how beautiful it looks. I use Umbrakos because they're rated at 12.9. Yeah, that's They're the highest good. tensile yeah. that you'll get. So yeah, there is a torque setting for this. You hear my wrist click. <laughs> so <laughs> I've, I've done plenty of these, so I know exactly what I've got to tension them to. Three Agadagas. <laughs> that's for the flywheel. So where are we up to? So this here, the thrust washer spacer, so your end float spacer. A lot of problems can occur when people pull the front pulley off. So it sits into the bottom thrust bearing. Uh, so you see it locates there. So what happens is sometimes when people change a front pulley of the engine, they lift it off, the spacer comes up, the bearing drops behind it, and then they crush it all back down. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Causes yeah. big problems. So they don't even right. know, they don't even know what's happened. Nah. Oh. You won't know what's happened. Oh. Well, you can check your end float, and that's a good sign that something's happened there. Yeah. So it's very important when you pull a front pulley off a rotary that this must be checked. Mm. The ultimate way, obviously, is to pull the front timing cover off and and just check. There's theories behind how you should do it and how. Uh, you shouldn't, but at the end of the day, that thrust washer drops, you're in big trouble. It will chew out bearings. Uh, so counterweight. So this was provided with the um, crankshaft. We can buy factory ones still, yeah. but we go for the aftermarket ones because they can run a, a thicker, well, they can run a, a heavier counterweight because what we run is actually Series 4 turbo rotors, which I should have went through with you, but um, so they're Series 4. slightly lower yeah, comp? Yeah, they're lower, 8.4 yep. to 1 compression ratio compared to your 9.0 in a factory 20B. Yeah. They're, they're heavier, which means your counterweights need to be heavier. Yeah, okay. So if we use the 20B ones, then we actually got to slug them. Mm. Um, by buying aftermarket ones, they're heavier, and then we can machine them down to suit our balance weights that we need. Our oil pump gear, which we're not using, we still need it there. And then our crank angle sensor gear. That's it, timing cover. This beer keg is nearly complete, Simon. Nearly there. So when we tighten the front nut, we're actually forcing the front lobe, the taper of the front lobe onto the main shaft. Yep. So this has to be very tight, um, 270 Newton meters. Oh, okay. Tight. That's tight. That's tight. And this is a good part too. Did you hear it turn over for the first time? It's always a good noise. Nice and smooth. Feel the two shafts moving. 
So 0.04 to 0.09 yep. um, is our end float. As I said, I've previously done it, so I know it's perfect. So yeah, let's have a look at it. And then we're gonna get the Norton liquid ice onto it. Simon, I think you've created a masterpiece. Thank you. It doesn't matter what angle you film it from. It looks crazy. So you'll notice we've engraved his logo in the housings. Yeah, that's come out really good. Yeah, it's come out very nice. So Rowdy's Garage. It's subtle, but it's easy to see yeah. at the same time. So Norton do a wide range of products. That's not only cleaning products or, or grinding, but we use um, like for deburring or anything like that. So your little flap wheels, you'll know on exhaust ports or when you, you want to deburr something, they give a really good finish as well. Now Simon, one thing I don't know if we touched on earlier was the compression of the engine. What have you done with the rotors? Uh, so the compression stays the same as we uh, 8.4 yeah. compression ratio, 8.4 to 1 compression ratio. So that stays the same, but what we do with the rotors is we machine side clearance them, tip clearance them, and also face clearance them, what we call face clearance. So the side clearancing allows, because you get a lot of flex in the shaft, our bearing support tries to mm. stop that, but you, you're going to get flex in it. So what happens is the, the rotor starts walking and moving. So by side clearancing it and tip clearancing it, you allow it to move without touching the end plates. With the face clearancing, when, when that does move and when on the compression stroke and it tries to flex it to the other side of the rotor housing, we've face clearanced it to help that as well, so to give it more clearance. So when it does flex, it won't hit the housing. One thing also is a lot of people lighten their rotors. Yeah, you hear, so you it, hear you it, it a lot. Term I don't do it. Yeah. So the thing is, when they lighten the rotors, what happens is, so they lighten them, yeah, it looks good, it's fantastic. And then when you go to balance them, um, so the balancing gets done on the, uh, basically on the side of the rotor and they take material out of there to balance it. When you lighten it, you can't take any more material out. So then they start taking it out of the oil cooling area. So when they take it out of that, I, it's never happened to me and because I don't lighten them, but I've seen it in the past where it starts cracking through there yeah. um, and causes more problems than what it's worth. So we don't lighten our rotors. And yeah, 13B making 1500 horsepower, <laughs> a, you know, without lightened rotors. Yeah. So it's probably more something you hear back in the day with naturally aspirated. 100%, yeah, yeah naturally aspirated, you know. We're shoving 70 mm. pounder boost through them. <laughs> it's amazing something, you know, this size can make, you know, 1500 horsepower, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Isn't well, it? Not even that yeah. big. Looks like a transmission. <laughs> it's um, yeah, they're a beautiful engine. They actually look them. like an electric motor. Yeah, the shape of them. Yeah, yeah, they do. You're right. So yeah, it's good that we can advance and make all these products. And obviously, we're going to move into doing some rotor housings and rotors, and as things get a bit cheaper, and mm. so we're always developing. Well, eventually you'll have to because there just won't be any of this stuff. No, that's left right. At yeah. some point. So twelve A's. And everyone used, to, everyone used to throw them in the yeah in the bin. Yeah. So now 12 A's. If we need to rebuild a 12 A and put new rotor housings, we've got to get 13 B ones and machine them down. Yeah. The 13 B ones. Well, hopefully they'll be around for a lot longer, because to produce them is very costly. It's the aluminium. Then with the chrome liner, that's where the cost lies. So there's no one that can do it cost effectively. It's amazing how well Mazda got that. You know, so what, 50, 60 years ago? Yeah, yeah. And they still hold up today. You'll see a lot of the early engines and that, they've all got studs in them. <laughs> so <laughs> it's weird, we're going back to that sort of, oh, it was, they're not as tight a yeah. tolerance as what mm. we're doing now, but yeah. So some of the stuff from back in the 60s, late 60s, you know, we're still using them. Yeah. So yeah. Using the same materials or same housings and, so Simon, a lot of people were probably wondering what something like this is worth. Now you have to take into account what 
an OE20B is worth to hot one up, yeah? Yeah, so basically I reckon um, by the time you pay 15,000 Aussie. This is Australian a, dollars? Australian dollars yeah. for a block. Then strip it down, rebuild it, and another 15,000 by mm. the time you bridge port it and do all the rest. So I reckon you, it's a good part of $30,000 yeah. yeah. Australian dollars. So I reckon for another 10,000 on average, because you can talk about different shafts and yeah. different, uh, obviously, semi peripheral ports. So options. there's a lot of options yeah, you can yeah. go for. But keeping it simple, you probably add another 10,000 or so by building a brand new block. So billet plates, brand new housings, brand new rotors, brand new crankshaft, and basically similar sort of specs. You, you'd, you'd seem to think around the $10,000 yeah, more. So yeah. 40 to 45,000. Uh, Australian, you'd seem to... So it sort of shows why a lot more people are starting to use definitely. billet plates. Yeah, definitely. Do it, do it once, do it right. It's not only about the billet plates, but for one, you can't buy a, a genuine 20B plate. You can't buy them. So if you pull a second-hand motor apart and it's cracked, which, you know, nine times out of ten, they've been through the wars. Yeah, so yeah. you can't even buy one new. Yeah. So then you've got to go and buy a billet one. So if you're buying a billet plate there, then that sends your 30,000 Australian up to 35. Mm. So you're getting closer to that. And you've still got second-hand parts. So this way, it is everything in, the ho in this whole engine is brand new. Yeah, like we but touched on we're before, not these, are, these are 25-year-old engines. So That's right, yeah. So we're not saying that this one's got a few different specs in it, so at the higher end of the market. So, yeah, we tailor it to suit the customer's needs, and that can change price wise yeah and obviously you guys do twin and four rotor options as well obviously yeah, there's definitely. a lot of 13b's out there isn't there yeah you want your most popular engine yeah we've done a lot of 13b um brand new billet engines like we've built here not saying it's a full billet engine we're just saying that the billet, it's plates, got billet so parts in yeah. it before anyone <laughs> yeah so everyone says oh but they're not billet housings yeah. and they're not uh, billet rotors and yeah, we just call it a billet engine because it's got billet plates. It's no different to guys using a billet block and using an a OE head. cylinder head. Yep. So it's exactly the exactly same thing. Right. Basically, our next build is going to be a, a quad rotor for Japan. Yeah. So that's something you probably want to come down yeah, and, and see that get put together. So that's another exciting project that we're working on. That uh, quad rotor is going in a Mercedes Benz. So uh, that's going to be pretty cool. All right, Simon, last time we filmed, we didn't quite finish the engine because we were missing some of the parts. No, oh, just the sump. So we're waiting on the dry sump pan. So that's been made, CNC, out of 6065. It's a beautiful product from Billet Factory. So we're going to drop that on the engine now and then it'll be ready to yep. uh, ship. The good thing is they're all O-ring grooved. No silicon needed. Oh, um, no messy goo. Nice big dash 16. Uh, well, we're going to put some uh, strainers in there just to protect the oil pump, beautiful bit of gear. We've got a few other parts, Yeah, other so nice billet parts. This is a Billet Pro electric water pump adapter with built-in Dash 16 AN fittings. So it keeps it nice and short and compact compared to everything else that's on the market. Also, um, it's got provision for your coolant sensor. It's got an O-ring groove, so no need for gasket. Gasket means sealant, means mess. Yeah. Uh, O-ring straight on, like everything else, it's beautiful. It's kind of fitting as a rotary outside. Yeah, mm. probably helps. What's that nice bit of gear you've got there, another so, piece? Yeah, this is a Billet Pro front, universal front engine brace. It's got some nilothane bushes to be pushed into this. We'll go onto the front engine. And then you can adapt it. It's going, this car engine is going into a BMW. This will allow him to mount it. Mount it accordingly. Accordingly. Yeah, yeah. perfect. All right, so Simon, that's it. She's done. That's it, it's done. We'll seal it all up. We've got a special plastic crate that we're going to put it in and send it over to New Jersey. All right, so... So the next time you'll see it, uh, hopefully be mounted in. He's got plans of um, building a nice billet plenum yeah. and that for it. Yeah, it's getting a fuel tech. He's already purchased the fuel tech FT600, FT Spark. So there's a lot of good gear going on it. Turbocharger wise, we're going to work out 
where we're going to start him off first um, because always when you're building a new car from scratch it's always better to start on the lower yeah, end sort the yeah. car out before going putting all this sort of power through it mm. and then working out that you can't use it anyway so we're just going to start off it's still going to be a massive turbo mm. <laughs> it's still going to be a big turbo but yeah it's always better to start on the lower it's not going to be a 106 mil yet yeah. Everyone does a big package and then on one. Well, it's not, it's not a drag car, so it doesn't have to be. No, drag. it's a bit of everything. Yeah. It's a bit of everything, this car. So probably be around the 91, 94 mil. So I'd like to thank uh, Cody from um, Rowdy's Garage for choosing Promaz to put their package together. It's been really exciting. It has taken a, quite a bit to get it to perfection, um, but I think we have. We, we've nailed it and uh, got all the good bits in it. Uh, got the colour combination that he's after. 